Alright, so in this video we're going to be continuing our coverage of the AP Physics C Barron's book uh, mechanics section, specifically dealing with universal gravitation uh, and Kepler's laws as well as how potential energy is calculated and maybe some practice problems at the end. But we'll start off with Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which I'll define really quickly for you and then illustrate them geometrically before we hop into the mathematics behind them. So the first law, or Kepler's first law, is that trajectories of planets are ellipses with the sun and one focal point, which is simple enough to illustrate. You have the sun here and an ellipse going around. Now each ellipse has two points, or two focal points, you know, one here and one there about there, and the sun is always at one of these two focal points in a planet's ellipse. The second one is a bit more complex, but it's a really cool uh, law, it's that uh, in equal times the position vector from the sun to a planet, so that vector right there, will sweep out equal areas. So if there's some time delta t here, then the position vector goes you know, from point A to point B and sweeps out this area here. Likewise, if you go you know, from point C here to point D here, in that same delta t, you'll find that these two parts have the same area due to the shorter radial distance. Now, with all that said, the last video, or the last law rather, uh, says that the ratio of the square of the period to the cube of the radii is the same for all planets. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's say we have, you know, planet one, we'll call this one, and then in a larger larger ellipse, we have planet 2. And so they'll have periods T1 and T2, respectively, with average distances of R1 and R2. Now what this law is basically saying is that T1 squared over R1 cubed is going to be equal to T2 squared over r2 cubed, which, because they're the same, will equal some constant for all the different planets. So, this ratio of the period of rotation of the Earth, you know, 365 and a quarter days, over its radius from the Sun, is the same as uh, the period of Mars squared over its radius cubed, and that holds true, you know, for Jupiter, Saturn, etc., all the objects around the Sun. Okay, so the first law sort of doesn't need a mathematical proof, or at least not one that we can do here, but the second law we can look at mathematically, and we'll start off by looking at the position vector from the sun to a planet as it changes a little bit over time. There's this amount of area, which we'll call dA. And what the second law states is basically that the change in this area over time is constant. So dA dt equals k. Now why is that? Well, we have to look at uh, the properties of this planetary motion. So, if you have within this area, you have d theta, and you have the radial distance r, and this dr right here we'll define as r d theta, just based on the properties of this right triangle, and over time it moves, you know, in this t plus dt, and this distance right here is r plus dr, very approximately due to the Pythagorean theorem. So we know that uh, this dA is, because it's very approximately a right triangle, is the base times the height over 2, and we know that the base is dr, which is r d theta, and the height is this distance r all over 2, or you get that dA equals r squared d theta over 2, but we know that uh, d theta with respect to time is just equal to omega. So we get that if you divide through by dt on both sides, d theta dt is omega, so you get that dA dt equals 
omega r squared over 2. But you should recognize this equation because uh, multiplying through by the mass, or really just mass over itself, we get that m r squared omega over 2 times the mass equals dA dt. But we know this m r squared is just the moment of inertia of a point mass, in this case the planet. So we get that I omega over 2 m equals dA dt. And I omega you should recognize as the angular momentum of the object from our earlier discussions of rotation. So we get that L over 2m equals dA dt, but because angular momentum is conserved due to there being no outside torque and the mass remains constant because you're not adding or subtracting any mass from the planet, we know that this term is constant, which means that dA dt is also constant. Now Kepler's third law holds true for all of the elliptical trajectories trajectories of the planets rather, but we're going to be looking more specifically at those that are approximately circles, which is the case for most of the planets. There's some uh, eccentricity in their orbits, but not by a whole lot. So when uh, the gravitational force is acting on an approximately circular orbit, we find that it corresponds to a centripetal force because the gravitational force is what is keeping the planets moving in their circular orbits. Now with that said, we can set our known equation for the centripetal force equal to the known equation for the gravitational force. In this case, we have mv squared over r equals, you know, g big M, we'll call the mass of the sun, little m is the mass of the planet over r squared. These little m's will cancel out, as will one r term, and we get that, you know, v squared equals g m over r. Now we can uh, substitute for uh, v squared, we can substitute omega squared r squared to get things more rotational. Omega squared r squared equals gm over r and bringing up this r we cancel that out and this becomes r cubed but we also know from our rotational definition of angular velocity that omega equals 2 pi over the period. So plugging in this and taking into account the now cubed radius of the planetary orbit, we get that omega squared equals 2 pi squared, in this case 4 pi squared over the period squared times r cubed equals gm, or transforming we get that r cubed over t squared equals gm over 4 pi squared. And if we just want to flip everything over to better fit the definition, we get that t squared over r cubed equals 4 pi squared over gm. And it makes sense that this all equals some constant k because the gravitational constant is constant, obviously, as is pi and 4, and the mass, in this case the mass of the Sun, is the same mass felt by all of the various planets. So all of the planets will share this common factor, k, as the ratio between the square of their period and the cube of their radius. Now the last concept we're going to be looking at in this video is uh, gravitational potential energy. Now gravitational potential energy uh, we used to measure as you know mgh and that only works when you are very close to the surface and you know the g value of a certain uh, spherical mass distribution but for a more generalized version, we have to look at uh, our known equations relating potential energy and gravitational force because we have a law for universal gravitation now. So we know that force equals negative du dx. And we also know that the equation for force of gravity, Fg equals big G m little m over r squared. Now, moving over this dx, we can see that, you know, g m m over r squared times dx equals 
du and we'll move the negative over as well. Now, as a convention, we set the origin for gravitational potential energy, so u g is usually written, equal to zero when the x position is an infinite distance away. So what you do is you integrate from infinity here to wherever the object is, in this case we'll call it r naught, you integrate to find the difference in potential energy from an infinite distance away to the actual uh, r value at which the two masses are separated. So to find that change in u, we integrate du, or in this case we integrate from uh, infinity to r naught of negative g m1 m2 over r squared. Now integrating that, you get that uh, negative, because these two negatives come out, you get negative m1 m2 over just the singular r through the integration from r naught to infinity, or that the gravitational potential energy at r naught equals negative g m1 m2 over r naught. And there's just a few things of note about gravitational energy in this equation. It should be noted that just like with our MGH approximation, the gravitational uh, potential energy is in fact conservative, and it can be superpositioned. In other words, the sum of the uh, potential energy of the total system is the sum of the constituent individual uh, potential energies of the objects. Now that concludes this video. In the next video we'll, doing a, we'll be doing a sort of summary of all that we've covered so far as well as some practice problems for universal gravitation.